an effort with them. So we, we really have to look at that. Right. So next talk uh, will be very happy to hear Edward uh, Rothman speaking about splitting fields of crystal forms with application to Copernium and Astronomy. Okay, yes. Uh, I first would like to thank the organizers for giving me the opportunity to talk here. Uh, it's my first live conference uh, for a long, long time, actually. So uh, because of the pandemic situation, of course. And it's even more of a pleasure to be here to do that uh, than usual. Okay, anyway. So I will talk about splitting fields of physical forms uh, with applications to quaternion and Newtonian algebras. And I will go back in time a little bit. Uh, oops, no, this is not working. Yes. Okay. So uh, this is something I, I did in my thesis uh, more than 30 years ago. Uh, it's about k-minimal forms. And the idea behind it was, there was some work by uh, Louis and Tangiel uh, based on, I will come to that, work by Rost on the excellence of function fields of conics. And they studied uh, what then I called minimal forms for a field extension. So these are basically, you're given a field extension and then you consider an anisotropic quadratic form that becomes isotropic over the field extension. Okay, but you don't want any subform of this form to become isotropic with a field extension. So if you restrict it to a subspace, proper subspace, then this restriction, when lifted to the field extension, will not become isotropic. And these forms I call minimal. Uh, simplest example is, of course, you take a credit field extension and then the here, let's say characteristic different from two, uh, the minimal forms for this quadratic field extensions are just the norm forms basically for, for this field extension up to a scalar factor. So that's not, not hard to show, that's quite well known. Uh, then you might look at that same situation characteristic two, take again a quadratic field extension, but as you know, in characteristic two, you have two types, separable, inseparable. If you take the inseparable case, inseparable case then you pretty much get the same result. But what you see here is a uh, form that is totally singular. It's not a regular quadratic form. Okay. If you want, say, non-singular minimal forms, or regular minimal forms, you have to modify it a little bit. They will be four-dimensional. And they will contain exactly these two slots from here. Up to a similarity, up to similarity, basically. Okay. Um, of course, then you will look at separable field extensions. And then you get again pretty much the known form of this separable field extension as minimal forms. Okay, so that's that's quite easy. It's just the motivation, basically. And uh, as I said in my thesis, I studied the case not for uh, for any field extensions because that was very it was too easy. I've gotten a PhD for that. <laughs> so <clears throat> we looked at function fields of conics, and there the situation becomes far more involved. Uh, we take again the case of characteristic different from two. And what's nice, actually, now Adam and Anke Yunea, you picked up that question again and looked at it in characteristic two, which is quite nice. Some more than 30 years after I had worked on that stuff. Okay, uh, then you can actually characterize minimal forms and you can characterize them in terms of so-called splitting sequences and they are based on Ross's proof of the excellence of the function field of the conic. <clears throat> uh, it's very technical, so I won't go into it. I will just say a few things. So you can show that these minimal forms are always of dimension, of odd dimension. Uh, greater or equal to three. Um, if you have a minimal form of some odd dimension, you have them in all smaller dimensions as well over that field. Uh, the constructed examples 
of fields, space fields, and conics so that you have minimal forms in any odd dimension greater than three. You can do that. Uh, if you look at the three dimensional case, it's just basically the conic itself. If you look at the five dimensional case, there's a nice characterization you can give. They are so called Fister neighbors, that is, they contain up to similarity some twofold Fister form, and they're contained in a threefold Fister form. And this threefold Fister form contains essentially the defining conic. Um, but you have the fact, in addition, that this twofold and this conic itself, when you look at them as a biquaternion algebra, it will be a division algebra. So you have to have all these conditions. Then you know this form is minimal, contains no conic, basically, up to the similarity. And so, for example, if you take a global field, you know this situation cannot arise. So you don't have five dimensional ones. So the only minimal forms are conics or a global field. You don't have to look for higher dimensional minimal forms. OK, so let's <coughs> turn things around. Uh, we just exchanged the roles of field extension and quadratic form. Now we fix the quadratic form. And look, and then as a proper quadratic form, we look at field extensions over which the form becomes isotropic, but no proper subfield will make this form isotropic. Yeah, just turn things around. And so you could call such a field extension Q minimal for this fixed quadratic form Q. I mean, this is something I just came up at hoc when preparing the talk. I have never really done research on that. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, of course, I mean, oops, no, why isn't it? So, okay. so let's start again. We fix a, a binary form. And then, of course, you get that the minimal field extensions are just this, uh, this. Q minimal uh, field extensions are just uh, the quadratic extensions because if this quadratic form becomes isotropic, it must contain this quadratic field extension. There's no way around it. And that holds in any characteristic. In, in, and of course, in, uh, if you take a binary non singular form characteristic, to, you get the same, you get a, this, this a separable quadratic field extension as minimal, unique minimal extension for that quadratic form. So <laughs> let's fix an anisotropic conic. And then of course, again, it becomes probably a little bit more complicated. What are the Q minimal algebraic field extensions, for example, you can ask. And then of course you can try to construct complicated things. Uh, so if you say fix the degree of the field extension, uh, then you can get a criterion, uh, say characteristic not to, uh, you have a quadratic field extension. So basically you ask, will this form, uh, will this uh, conic become isotropic or not? That's the only question you have to ask. Because if it's quadratic, there is no intermediate field you have to check. Okay, and then you have a simple criterion, you, you just have to check whether this form is isotropic or not. That's all. Okay. Uh, for odd extensions, you don't have to check anything. <laughs> Let's forget about that. Let's look at degree, degree four. What do we get there? So here's an example. Uh, of course, what I did here is I tried to construct a degree four extension that doesn't have any intermediate fields. And if you have a conic that becomes isotropic over that field extension, then of course, that will be a minimal field extension in that sense, because you can't find anything smaller. Okay, so here's an example of a Q. You take sum of three squares, or equivalently you take sum of four squares. That doesn't make a difference. Because if one becomes isotropic, the other one will become isotropic. Okay, so then say find a polynomial of degree four that has Galois group S4. They do exist. <coughs> Given down one example. Uh, then you know there won't be any intermediate field. 
Okay, and then I have written down an equation over that field extension that shows that this conic becomes isotropic. Okay, so that would be a very neat example, but of course it's cheating because I don't have any intermediate fields. <laughs> okay, let's look at an example where I do have intermediate fields and where do I have, where I have, I have to check everything for the intermediate fields. And that of course also exists. I took a bicredit extension and I took this credit form, 1715 or the associated FISTA form. Again, it doesn't make any difference which of the two forms I take. I take the extension generated by square root minus one and square root five. And then I wrote down an equation that shows you that this form becomes isotropic, rather simple equation. And you see in that equation, of course, you need both these uh, roots I join, and then you can show, remember the criterion I showed you before, whether something becomes isotropic or with credit extension or not. So you can basically check it over the base field. You get three forms you have to check, and you just check that they're all anisotropic over the base field. And of course, you can do that with uh, Asenikovsky. It's not that difficult to check. Check it locally. Okay. So then you see it will not become isotropic of any of, of, of the three intermediate fields. So that would be again a minimal extension. Here is an, a generic example. Take any field of characteristic module, join three variables, and then I've written down some sort of generic uh, twofold pista form. Uh, and then again, you can show that this form becomes isotropic. Yeah, I've written down, I've written down the equation there. And then again, you go with the different forms. And again, you do some specialization. Most of the time, you can specialize in z equals zero. Uh, for one case, you have to specialize z equals minus x to show that it's anisotropic. Okay. So here you have lots of examples. Of course, you can make it arbitrarily complicated. As I said, I never did research on that. I just came up with these examples for the sake of this talk. Um, let's change the objects. Let's look at central simple algebras. You can ask the same questions. You have a uh, central simple algebra and a field extension, and let's call it such an algebra minimal, if it's a division algebra, it becomes, it's not division over the field extension. And well, there are various ways you can think of what minimal should mean. I say it doesn't contain any central simple subalgebra uh, that becomes not division. So in, in other words, it cannot decompose into a tensor product where one of the factors becomes not division. Okay. So, of course, if you have, you start with an indecomposable algebra, then, and, and you know that it becomes isotropic, then you're done. You have an example of something minimal in that sense, because you cannot decompose it as a tensor product. Okay. Uh, Again, a few simple examples. Say the characteristic is different from two, and you look at degree two uh, k minimal uh, algebras, quaternion algebras. They're exactly the ones that are of this type. Well, I should pay, say empty division, of course. Uh, these would be minimal. Uh, if it's degree four and dk is not division, uh, I assume exponent two, so it's a bicoternion algebra. Uh, you cannot find such a minimal algebra because you can always decompose it into the product where one of the products or one of the factors already becomes the size of traffic. So that cannot happen. But in degree eight, exponent two, there are examples where you can construct such minimal things because you, you start with anything in the composable with degree eight, it will always contain a credit sub extension. And 
so you take this quadratic sample extension for that quadratic sample extension, it will be minimal. And of course, that's original examples is due to, to Amit Soron, to your things. Okay. Let's look at function fields for conic, of conics, since we had conics before. Uh, what are the uh, minimal division, central simple division algebras for function fields of conics? Okay, of course, I assume the, the conics anisotropic, anisotropic case is not interesting as usual. Transcendental extension. Okay, suppose these division, but dk is not. Hard. Well, then you have the index reduction theory. And by Mercurier, we then know that the even part of the Clifford algebra uh, of this form maps homomorphically into D. But the even part of the Clifford algebra will be just this quaternion algebra, AD. Uh, so that maps homomorphically, so you'll find a copy of that in there. It's a central simple algebra. So again, it factors. Yeah, use just the, the other factors, of course, the centralizer. Okay, so you get there's the result. The minimal uh, k-minimal uh, algebras are just. It's just this quaternion algebra. There isn't that anything else. Okay. Well, of course, again, you can look at other types of field extensions. Um, maybe you can start doing research on these questions. Uh, again, let's turn things around. We fix the division algebra. And then we call a field extension minimal for that division algebra if it becomes. Uh, it's not division anymore when you pass to the field extension, <laughs> but it will stay division for any proper intermediate field. Okay. And again, uh, remark here, if, you're, if your division algebra is a determined division algebra and L is a field extension, uh, then of course we can do what we did before because you replace the division algebra just by its known form. And I asked this question for quadratic forms before. Okay, so we might as well ask that, and then you can basically get examples in that context. Uh, and and this was actually the the initial motivation behind the work I did. And this was a question which Bernard Mühler asked me. And they're working on octonium division algebras. And he asked, well, given the field of characteristic two, you have an octonium division algebra of that field. And that splits over a purely inseparable quadratic extension. Is it true that you can always already find a quadratic sub extension? What they wanted to have is basically filling one slot in, the, if you look, think of, this octonian algebra is three slots, filling one slot with this quadratic extension, basically. And they hope for that, but I have to disappoint them. Uh, my initial thought was it's unlikely. Okay. But then, of course, being unlikely and knowing it's not true is, uh, are two different things. Uh, I had to find counterexamples. And of course, in a certain sense, it's related to that question of minimality. And that's why I had this introduction about minimality, basically. So since I want to answer that particular question, all fields will be of characteristic too. There was a time when every talk about graded forms or central simple algebras or so started with have to be a field of characteristic different from two. And <laughs> recently it's more of that. <laughs> okay. Let's look at algebraic field extensions. Well, what does it mean to be purely inseparable? Of course, everybody knows that. It means that just some since many characteristic to a, a, a two power power 
of that element will be in the base field. Uh, that should be K here, by the way, not S. Otherwise, it would be trivial. Uh, <laughs> okay, so the exponent is basically what is the smallest two power? So that if you raise an element to that two power, uh, you end up in, in S. That's called the exponent of that purely separable field extension. It could be infinite, of course. And if you have a purely separable extension, then it's you will always be a two power if finite. And so if you look at exponent one extensions, these are basically multiple quadratic <coughs> purely, purely separable extensions. And if you know that the degree is less than or equal to two to the n, uh, you can do it with n square roots. And if you know that, that the degree is two to the n, you will need n square roots. You cannot do it with your. So of course, that means that uh, you're not in the you're not in the case of separable extensions where you know you can always do it with one element, and that makes the thing completely different from the separable case. Okay. Uh, to do my examples, I need a little bit background on on bilinear forms and characteristic two and. Well, my bilinear forms are always assumed to be non-singular and finite dimensional. Uh, you can actually always diagonalize bilinear forms as long as they represent something non-zero. And the only bilinear forms that do not represent anything non-zero are the hyperbolic forms. That is also the sum of hyperbolic planes. They only represent zero. Okay. Otherwise you can always diagonalize. Uh, and for pista forms are just products of binary forms as usual. Uh, they have also all the nice properties you're used to when you did the theory and characteristic different from two. So they are isotropic if and only if they're metabolic. Metabolic doesn't hyper, hyperbolic implies metabolic, not but not uh, vice versa. Uh, metabolic just means having a totally isotropic subspace of half the dimension. Uh, and the elements represented by a bilinear FISTA forms are exactly also the similarity factors, the non zero elements. Okay, then we have the notion of FISTA neighbor and so on. Uh, we also have the notion of bilinear uh, quadratic FISTA forms. Uh, for that, you have to look at quadratic forms in characteristic two, and of course, uh, you have non-singular forms or non-degenerate forms, and totally singular forms. Uh, the non-degenerate, non-singular binary forms are just uh, uh, the you have totally singular forms. You have ju just diagonal forms. These are the totally singular forms. And you have a tensor product of a bi bilinear and quadratic forms, which when you have a nice diagonalization, you have to see what it means. Uh, you can always decompose uh, quadratic forms, splitting off a few hyperbolic planes, uh, splitting off some zeros, they will be in the radical. And what remains is something here that will be anisotropic. Uh, you have a regular part here, uh, a totally singular part here, and there are certain things that are invariants. For example, the number of hyperbolic planes, that's called the Witt index, that's an invariant. The number of zeros here, that's called the defect, that's an invariant. Uh, the anisotropic part is an invariant. Uh, the radical is basically everything totally singular. That's the radical. That's an invariant. Uh, what is the non-defective part is, if you take that away, that's also invariant. But what is not invariant is the regular part. It's, if you don't have anything there, it's okay. But the moment you have something here, you can move something from here into here, basically to change that part. Okay. So you have to be a little bit careful. Uh, and as I said, you have quadratic FISTA forms. Uh, 
And they're just products of a bilinear twister form with a binary quadratic form, one singular quadratic form. And again, <coughs> they have all the nice properties you're used to. They're isotropic, they're hyperbolic. Uh, the similarity factors are just the non zero values represented by that twister form. You have the note of twister neighbor and the set of quadratic twister forms up to isometry that is denoted by PNF. Okay. For turning algebras, uh, we're also known characteristic two generated by two elements. Uh, one is basically uh, uh, you have basically an inseparable part, a separable part, if you will. Okay. And there's some relation how to swap to generators. Uh, you have an involution, the standard involution that keeps, fixes basically the separable, uh, the inseparable generator uh, and has the usual action on the separable generator. You have a norm form, which is the periodic system form. Um, again, you have the usual relation that uh, it's a division algebra if and only if the norm form is anisotropic and the isometry class of the norm form determines the isomorphism class of the quaternion algebra. It's versa. Okay. And if you're interested what happens over periodic extensions, when does such a quaternion algebra split? If it's a division algebra over quadratic, quadratic extension characteristics two. In the separable case, basically, it means you can choose the second slot as this element from your uh, quadratic extension. And in the inseparable case, you can choose the first slot. Basically, that's happens in the quadratic case. Okay, Octonian algebras are eight dimensional algebras, also well known, I suppose, here. And you can get them from a quaternion algebra using the Katie Dixon construction. Uh, so you have basically a copy of quaternion algebra plus some, uh, you have another generator called L in this case, L times Q would be the other fact uh, summoned in this construction. And then you have a multiplication where this involution plays into. Don't want to go too much into details because we have again a norm form, and again you have the fact that this octonian algebra is division is known as the associated threefold twister form is anisotropic, and again octonian algebras are basically characterized by their norm form. So that's all what I need, and that's why I said, well, splitting of twister forms with applications to octonians and uh, quaternions. Because if I know something about vista forms, I know something about, about quaternions and octonians for that reason. Okay. And again, you can look at what happens with an octonian algebra. When does it split over a quadratic extension? If, an, if it's an inseparable quadratic extension, square root d, then you can put d in the first slot. And otherwise, you put this d if it's minus one d then you can put D in the second slot, in the, in the last slot. Uh, by the way, uh, very often the convention about people working with quaternion algebras is just the other way around. They put the square bracket here on the other side. <laughs> but then I would have to put the square bracket on my pistol phones also on the other side. And I don't want to do that because I work with really, I prefer to work with quadratic forms. So. I changed this convention a little bit. I always find it awkward to do the swap. Okay, so now the original question becomes, suppose you have an anisotropic n-fold quadratic twister form and a purely inseparable extension over which this twister form becomes isotropic, which is equivalent to becoming hyperbolic. Does there exist a quadratic sub extension so that this twister form will already become isotropic over this sub extension? So that's 
basically now the generalized question. And the original question was just the case n equals three. Okay. And of course, since I'm a correct forms guy, I want to do it for, for every n. Uh, the case n equals one cannot occur. Uh, one fold Pfister form is a non degenerate one of this type, and it will stay anisotropic over any purely inseparable extension. So the case n equals one is not interesting. Uh, in order to do the case n equals two, uh, well, there's something you can say on the number of generators of such splitting fields. <clears throat> if you have a purely inseparable splitting field, so you know you have your Pfister form that splits over a purely inseparable extension. You know that this extension probably needs a lot of generators. And if how many generators or, or how many elements do you actually need to find a splitting field inside this big, big splitting field? Okay, so that's, if, if, if you could find a quadratic sub extension, that would mean one element would suffice, one generator for this intermediate field. So in general, how many generators will you need? Uh, no, 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 not, not, not even that. And so what I can show is, it, so you take, take an anisotropic crystal form of uh, n fold n greater equal to two, case n equals one, we just discarded, n equals greater or equal to two. Then if you have a purely inseparable field extension over which this form splits, then you can find elements bounded, a number of elements, which is the number is bounded by two to the n minus one minus one, such that this form will already split over this subfield for these generators. Now, if you put n equals two, the case if we turn, you know, then you will see that you only need one element. Okay. So if you have a quaternion division algebra and that it splits over a purely inseparable extension, then it will always split over, over a simple sub-extension. Which might not necessarily be quadratic, quadratic, but it's simple at least. Okay, so you can always do that. For threefold Pfister forms, the formal formula would give you three. So you can always do it with three elements. That would pro probably be a question for, for the problem session. Give an example where you need three. I can give you example where, examples where you need two. <laughs> so you cannot in general do it with one element. Okay. So this is what I just said. If you have a quaternion division algebra, you can do it with one element. And if you know that the exponent is one, then of course, this extension will be a quadratic sub extension. So in that case, you get a positive answer to the, the Mueller question, but it's for quaternion algebras and it's only for exponent one <laughs> inseparable extensions. Okay, so partially positive. Uh, to give you my examples, I have several examples. So I, I, I thought about, well, can one find simple sub extensions? Can one bound, give a bound on the exponent or something like that? And so my first example is vertical. So basically, uh, what does that mean? So I take an n fold, uh, n plus three fold Pfister form, pi, and I construct an extension of degree two to the m uh, and exponent l. And there are certain conditions that have to be satisfied by m and l that are rather natural in order to make that example work. They look a little technical, but they're, when you do it, the examples, it turns out they're rather, rather natural. Okay, uh, so you can construct such examples where you fix the degree and the exponent, pi becomes isotropic, but pi L stays anisotropic over any simple sub-extension uh, contained in K. And why do I say vertical? If, if I think of my, something like that, okay. 
here's my field F, this is my field K. Vertical, uh, what, what are simple extensions? You pick an element and basically what you get is something like this. You pick another element, you have something like this and the subfields will be just lined up like this. There, all the subfields form a chain in a simple, purely and separate extension. Okay, that's what I mean by working. Okay. Uh, for the construction, well, just choose suitable integers that satisfy the conditions you want, meaning that there's some of them add up to M and then one should be L. And you can always do this under these assumptions you have given there. So then you choose any field with two, a two independent set of elements. Uh, N plus R plus three. So two independent just means if you adjoin the square roots to that field, then it will be an extension of two to the N plus R plus three. That just means two independent. What you could do, for example, you take a rational field in, in these many variables. They will be two independent. Okay. Uh, then I take the normal series field over this field. Uh, and then my field extension will be just square root one of the variables, square root x z plus y, and then some square roots. Uh, two power roots of, of some of, of, of these remaining elements. This makes sure that you will have exactly the right degree. It will also make sure that the, you have the correct exponent. L is the biggest one here. You know, that, that basically makes sure that you have the correct exponent. And the form, here you plug in the other variables in your form. And, but you have to take T minus one. That's important. If you take T, it will become isotropic. You have to take T minus one. Okay, so this is your crystal form. And the two independent of the chosen elements, and then you use some specialization arguments and so on involving T, this shows that T uh, pi will be anisotropic. Uh, to show the isotropy, I will only work with that extension. I show that it already becomes isotropic over that sub extension. That's sufficient, of course, you know. Uh, but that's not a simple sub extension. I said I don't want a simple sub extension over which it becomes isotropic. Okay. And then you get an easy equation that shows you that this form, this bilinear form, will become. Isotropic, so the form that contains basically this bilinear form, or where this bilinear form is effective, will also become isotropic. Uh, then, of course, the hard work starts. Show that uh, you, you first show that B stays anisotropic over any proper intermediate field between S and S prime. Such an extension would be simple. You can show that. So this, this is a little bit of work. And then, then the really hard work starts because now you have a much bigger field. This, you're still here of a very small subfield in which you work. But then you have to show that using some arguments that all what you want extends to this bigger field. And that's a lot of fiddling around. But you can do that. Okay. So that would be the first example. And if you want it, as a counterexample to the Mühlhaar Weiss question, you take, you start with F2, three variables, uh, Laurent series over this field. Uh, then you take, you join these <coughs> square roots. So you have a bitoretic, purely inseparable extension, uh, exponent one. Your FISTA form will be x, y, t minus one. And by what was shown, this is a div this is division. It's split over the spike word extension, and it will be division over, over any 
uh, sub extension properly contained in K, in that case, this would be uh, over any extension L properly contained in K, that would be a correct extension. Okay. Okay. So that's an example, a counterexample. So broken down like that, it doesn't look too complicated. And of course, I had first this example, and then I tried to generalize the rest. Okay. Uh, the second one is the horizontal version. Uh, here, you again have this uh, uh, given degree of your extension and the given exponent of your extension. And then you want to show that your fist support becomes either tropic or disputed extension, but not over any sub extension of smaller exponent. And that's why it's horizontal. Basically, you bound the exponent. That basically cutting off your extension here. Uh, this way, F itself would be exponent zero. And again, you do it generically, basically. Uh, you need some two independent elements. Uh, here, you need n plus r plus one. Uh, here, you take also the law series field uh, and t to the power two to the L. Uh, I could have used t and then used square roots later on or model power roots, whatever, but I decided to do it that way to avoid some symbols. And then your fist form will be. Uh, well, here you again have these these very these two different elements. They don't, they don't really in any of these computations in a certain sense. Of course, you have to show that, but they don't interfere at all. Uh, what's important is this: what's at the end. That's important. And I claim that this crystal form will satisfy all the properties. And then your field extension will be where you. Well, this will be the, just a joining T. So basically, now here you are, or you have, you have this here. And, that. and then again, you join these roots of the BIs just to get the right degree and the right exponent. Uh, here, I should probably say there's a little mistake. Uh, Algebra should be ZY. The way I've chosen it. Okay, so that should not be an X. That should be a square. So here you need two variables. Uh, then Laurent series, and then you take. This is Octonian algebra. Again, you show that this is a division algebra, this is split, and it will uh, stay division of, over any extension. Here, in that case, actually, it's a simple extension. It's a simple extension. And there's only one proper sub extension, namely, it's this extension. And it will stay in as a tropic over this proper sub extension. Let's just check the isotropy. Uh, again, this should be a Z here, but it doesn't matter. Let's just look at this part here. This contains this form. Uh, so it's the form U squared plus UV plus Y squared T minus four V squared plus Y W squared. And then when you substitute Y squared T minus two, uh, squared y squared t minus two squared t minus four, and and you see at at this point you need this t minus one. You really need this element here. You cannot do it only with t squares. So you get an equation that shows you that it becomes isotropic. Okay. Uh, 
Um, this was pretty much it. Uh, I would like to thank Bernhard Müller for inspiring this work, posing this question, and, and Skip. He was bothering me when I, he, 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 he read this, he, he realized he, he got hold of the paper of the archive. And then he looked at me and said, well, what about separate extensions? I said, well, that was not my topic. Said, yeah, but I want to know. So, <laughs> so I came up with these examples of these bi-theoretic extensions and, and this degree four extension that doesn't contain any, any subfield. And I showed it to him and I said, oh, these are nice examples. I will put them in my book as an exercise. <laughs> so <laughs> so uh, you will probably find these examples in his, I think he's worked on a book right these days, no? Exactly. So he said, uh, he asked, can I use them as, as an exercise? <laughs> so I said, yes, of course. And, and all that is published in, uh, actually it was published this year. Okay, and um, thank you. Yeah. It seems like you can rephrase the question in terms of the continuity homology. Exactly. So that's what I thought when when you saw this. I thought you're thinking in terms of symbols, <laughs> splitting symbols, basically. Uh, well, I, I I haven't worked on it, but I I thought one should work on it, and then of course generalize it not to just characteristic two, but characteristic p symbols uh, in, in characteristic p in cartomel cohomology or even pn or whatever. Of course, I mean, it's, it's a natural extension of, of what I did here. And you, in a certain sense, you have a blueprint of what types of fields you might want to work with. Yeah, exactly. You just change all those codes. Exactly. I mean, there might be some technicalities that might pop up, but, but still you have a blueprint. And I think one can probably generalize it. I would be surprised if, if, if not. So. And <laughs> maybe, maybe not. <laughs> well, I mean, the point is some of the computations really use uh, quadratic forms. And, you know, when you, when you want to check isotropy of quadratic form, you, you know what to do. With symbols, it's a different matter. You know, if you want to show, show that a symbol is zero, uh, you have to use norm maps and, and, and things like that. So it becomes more technical. It definitely becomes more technical, but it should be doable. Okay. <laughs> Tool. So there, I mean, I only use uh, separable extensions, uh, inseparable extensions, I mean, purely inseparable extensions. And of course, you can ask questions where you get rid of this assumption. I mean, I, I restricted myself to purely inseparable extensions because that was the original question. I, and I wanted to, to, co to cover that question in, in utmost generality in a certain sense, you, you know, going from twofold and threefolds to, to n-folds and so on. Uh, and of course, you can now ask uh, about this minimality. That's why I started out with this minimality, basically. You know, find minimal field extent. What can you say about minimal field extensions for a certain given Quaternion algebra, for example? I mean, that's a, as I said, I, I just came up with this question ad hoc when I prepared my talk. And I said, well, yeah, well, why not look at that? But then, of course, you, you immediately you realize, oh, that can become quite tricky if you don't make any assumption on the type of field extension you want to look at, because there are simply too many field extensions. You know, do you only want to consider algebraic field extensions, only separable field extensions, characteristic two or whatever, you know, then of course you can ask these questions. And, and so the point was of these examples to show that, well, you cannot expect things to become non-division when, if it becomes a division over an algebraic extension, you cannot expect it to become division over some sub-extension. Just in general, you cannot expect that. You know, that's, that, that was the point for, for this lengthy introduction. <laughs>
more questions? Thanks, Claudia. Yeah, five minutes.